Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Leadership in Politics with Dr. Abraham. On the show with me today are two special guests, best-selling author Paul Smith and co-author Kenny Tedford. This conversation is very special to my heart because it does deal with disability and the challenges disabled individuals face and they attempt to overcome. In particular, my guest Kenny has become one of two hearing impaired individuals that received and earned a master's degree in storytelling. Please indulge us as we share his story of challenges, success, perseverance, hardships, and achievement. Join me in welcoming Paul and Kenny. It's nice to see you, Paul, back, and nice to see you, Kenny. Welcome both to Leadership in Politics. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me back on. I enjoyed my last visit, and I'm looking forward to this one as well. It's wonderful. I'm looking forward for the first time. And Kenny, nice to see you, sir. How are you? Thank you. Doing fantastic. It's wonderful. So, Paul, last time you were on the show, we were talking about your last book, Four Days with Kenny Thetford. And you said, you suggested, let's have Kenny on. In a way, we're celebrating Kenny's achievements. Here we are. What do you want to tell us? Tell me a little bit about the situation, how you met Kenny. Yeah, so I, I met Kenny, gosh, it's probably been seven or eight years ago now. We were both speaking at a conference, a, a National Storytelling Network conference, but we didn't know that because he was on one stage and I was on another stage at the same mm -hmm. time. And then later we ended up sitting on the front row watching someone else's performance and literally just sitting right next to each other. And that's how we met. But I very quickly, of course, realized that he's, he's uh, very different than most people that you would run into at a conference, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he's, he's deaf in both ears and partially blind in one eye and, um, uh, you know, couldn't speak until he was really the age of 10 or so. And, um, you know, struggled with a learning disability most of his life. And so he has a, a lot of challenges that most of us don't have. And, um, and I just became uh, interested in him right away and fascinated because as you'll quickly find out, he's just one of the most charming people you'd ever meet. He sure and I is. just thought if, if I was born with all of those challenges, I, I might be a very angry, bitter person. <laughs> and, and he's not. And I just, I just love that about him. And uh, it encouraged me to want to learn more. Kenny, welcome yeah. to the show. Come on. So how was it working with Paul on the book? How was the journey? It's been amazing. I, I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm a very faithful person. Uh, how we depend on God for a lot of things. And actually everything. And um, I've been playing since I was a kid. I mean, my mother and father told me before they died that I was a storyteller and a teacher. Everybody had always been telling me this all my life. So I thought I should put it in a book. But, you know, I don't, I've had several people already come up and say, I want to write your book. You got to tell the world your story. And that's what Paul did. And then of course, the first time he did it, I was like, sure. Yeah, right. Okay. And then we met almost every day after we had coffee or we had breakfast or we had lunch. And the more and more Paul just got back to questions. And I was like, hmm, this guy getting a little too personal. I think he asked him too many questions. Mm -hmm. So he was really getting to know me. And so um, that was it. And then with some time later, I get this um, that of email, I believe it was, from Paul's email. And he, I decided, I, I just want to do your book. Let me let come up here to my home, spend four days with me, and, you know, let's go with it. And then I was like, oh, God, a trip. And then he was more like telling me, well, I'm going to warn you. We're not going to do tour. We're not going to the river. We're not going to the museum. You're going to work with me from 8 in the morning to 6 at night and do nothing but tell stories. I said, you're a little bit too. There's no way I can talk that long because I'm sure you have enough stories. So he did. So if it was it was four days he spent he spent with you at home, Paul. He spent four days with you. Yeah, at, at my house here at my house with my wife and two boys, um, with me interviewing him all day long. And and part of the beauty of that is that some of the time my wife and kids got to listen to our interview and to him telling stories. And the more they listened, the more they wanted to come back and and listen to more and more. And so it actually, it, it changed the whole dynamic of the book because it was intended to be a third person biography of his life. And it turned into something of a memoir of the four days that we spent together because now myself, my wife, my two sons are all characters in the book. 
Mm -hmm. And you not only get to see Kenny's life story play out, but you get to see the impact his life story is having on me and my wife and kids as we get to reflect on what his stories meant to us and what it made us think about our own lives and our own parenting skills. And so it, it, it really became a very introspective book, uh, more, more than it became a biography. So you learned from him as much as he learned from you? I learned much more from him than I'm sure he, he's what, learned from what me. What did you learn from him? What was it that he oh, learned from? Yeah, well, we, we actually ended up the final chapter of the book. We've uh, tried to outline 25 or 30 different life lessons for people who have disabilities to be more successful in their own life. But then half of them are lessons for people who love someone who have a disability and how to help them be more successful. So, so that's all captured in the, at the end of the book, but just my own parenting skills, learning from how Kenny's father treated him helped me you know, realize mistakes I was making with my own son. Um, you know, just for example, um, his father was very patient with him, uh, with his disabilities. And I have at times been very impatient with my own children. And listening to Kenny tell his stories made me realize that we really all have disabilities. It, it's just mine are different than yours. Kenny's is hearing, you know, and vision are his two major disabilities. It turns out, you know, my son at one point was having a problem understanding how metaphors worked. And when I would have a conversation with him and use a metaphor, even though he was a teenager, he just, he didn't get it. Kenny's life stories helped me have patience for other people's strengths and weaknesses and hopefully for them to have patience with mine. So he impacted your life to the better. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Kenny, how about with Paul? How did he impact you and what did you learn from him? Yeah, quite a bit. I don't know if I need to tell the truth or not, but you know, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, sure. Um, not only did I think when we first met, when we four days, we only spent five days together just recently before the coronavirus hit. But I would have to say, um, I'm grateful. I mean, I, I, to me, Paul has very much patient all the time I've known him. Um, there may be a couple of times, uh, I, I can only study faces. And so there'll be times when I could look at his face and he's like, okay, I'm gonna say this for the 20th time, you know? And I'm like, okay, you know, this time he be said it the 20th time, I still don't understand, I go, I got it. And he look at me and goes, you ain't got it, don't you? you know? So I, again, as I said, because of my faith, I believe without, without a doubt, God had allowed me to meet Paul. It was not a coincidence, it wasn't a mistake. We just happened to be at the same conference, we sat next to each other. And his friendship and more, becoming more like a brother, more nice. and more to know him. Um, but the thing about it, I have never told Paul, I may have, but, the greatest thing I've learned from others, I'm sorry about my voice. Um, when I'm at home, I don't talk, I sign a lot with yes. friends. And so when I don't use my voice, it becomes hoarse. Mm -hmm. So I have to talk more. So this is not my real voice. I don't think. It sounds like, it sounds corny. But anyway, I uh, want your audience to know this is not how I sound. But um, one of the greatest gifts I got from knowing Paul up to this point, after seven to eight years, was the very first day I walked in his house. To me, I get this a lot from a lot of people. I, I walked in the house and I, I don't know how much Paul told his family that I, about all my disability. But his youngest son at that time, I think was, I'm just guessing, I think he was eight or nine maybe. Mm -hmm. And when he was introduced to me, you know, his oldest son reached out to can, his wife reached out to can, and, and the little one was behind his mother. I mean, just holding on for dear life. And I was like, and he'll go the other way. And I'm like, he'll go the other way. Well, I'm sorry, but he don't like people in the house. He don't like strangers. I said, oh, well, okay. And so I'm used to that. So after several days, and then I came another time, and, it just, and recently we went on a tour together for the book tour and speaking engagement. A greatest blessing I had was going in that door recently. Uh, it was Thanksgiving time. I got to go to Paul's friends for Thanksgiving. 
And more than that, and it was just incredible because he had come to stop. Remember, he was eight or nine when I met him. It's been seven years. So now he's a grown boy. I think grown boy. he's yeah. 15 now. And he just walked up and said, hey, how you doing? You know, took hands. A totally different perspective. He didn't, he didn't really wait for his mom and dad. He just came up and took my hand. And probably didn't know this, but probably busy with a lot of things, you know. And they were at a meeting. Somehow I've been living with him and his wife with his older son just talking about something. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, you know, looking at my book. And his youngest son, who was so afraid of me, the first time came and sat next to me and said, what's up? And I was like, amen. So this is basically what I want. I want everybody to be able to read the book. And we were like, well, all the time. And not to be afraid of us, they're the disabled. We might can teach you something. And uh, so that's my goal in the book, to realize we're all the same. We're all the same for sure. We're all the same for sure. Basically, Paul described you as a brother, and you feel the same way toward him and his family. You build this relationship bond between you and him based on this sincere engagement to write your story about, you said disability, but you defied everyone. You said, that's true, I'm disabled, but I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah. You, you proved them wrong. You, now you're one of two, Paul, he's one of two that has a master. So yeah, Kenny is one of uh, two deaf people who has a master's degree in storytelling. Storytelling, I see. And Kenny proved to be a master, as you know, you're the master as well, but he proved to be a master storyteller. It's mm -hmm. to prepare for this, because I wanted to get introduced to you, Kenny. I went to YouTube and I start watching literally hours, some of these keynote speaking uh, speeches you had. To me, my friend, you are a genius <laughs> in presenting. Thank you very much. I appreciate you captured it. the I audience. You captured the audience. You made them tear up. You made them smile. You engaged them. I hope so. That's my goal. That's okay. So tell me about this. Where did that come from? To learn the skills, as we know, we discussed with Paul last time, to learn the skills as a storyteller telling is a must. And you had a master in it. But you, within you, since the time you were born, three months or, or after, people told you you're disabled, you're going to amount to nothing. You are going to be a disabled individual, and that's it. When did you know that, no, I'm not disabled? And if I am disabled physically, I'm going to prove you wrong that I can achieve more than an average person or a person without disability can achieve. Take me into that point because I want people to learn from you how they overcome or lived with disability. Well, um, I guess the best way to answer that is if Paul can jump in if he had to, but I'm not making my English correct. Uh, also with my disability, I have a learning disability. I'm, I'm still a child. Uh, I mean, I look like an old man, you know, grandpa, but I still have the mind of a child and, and the heart of a child, I guess. But my mind's not all really, it's not negative. I'm not all really that bright in, in reading. And Paul knows this. Uh, everybody around me knows. Um, growing up, I was growing up, my, my mom had nine children. I'm number seven, and there were two more behind me, Saint, uh, Mary and Robert, and Sandy was my next oldest. So mom married my father and we had four children. She had five from another husband. Mm -hmm. So growing up, uh, even in school, uh, I was made fun of. Uh, first I would put in, I don't know if they do it, at, if you did it growing up, but uh, in, in Texas and Tennessee, uh, I grew up in Texas, Dallas, and then moved to Memphis after my parents died when I was nine. Uh, you have to take an equivalent test at the mm -hmm. end of, in, in May to decide if you can go to the next year, you know, the next, like, fourth to fifth. Yes, yes. And if you yeah. fell in, you have to stay in the fourth grade again. And I never understood that. I spent one whole year proving I can do this. Now they want to do it all over. And that wasn't really, quote, I would say fair to people with learning disability because I fell. So I sat back one year. 
And um, so there were kids around me that didn't want to, for example, I don't know if you know what dodgeball is. Um, we played dodgeball and, you know, got to play whoopal ball, whoopal, you know, classic, you know, big bat, you know, and uh, I'm not sure how y'all say it, but a, a whoopal ball. And so every time they pick a team, I'll be the last one standing there while everybody's on the side. And they're all looking at me and then the two captains start to fight. You get them. No, you get them. No, you get them. So I don't like fights. So I just looked at both of them and said, tell you what, I'll sit by the tree and I'll be a cheerleader for mm -hmm. both of them. And they go, yeah, that's the man. But I went to the tree to sit and cry because nobody wanted me. To play with and you. That was even before my parents died. And then getting on the bus, we went to what you call a road trip, field trip, and nobody wanted to sit next to me. I was bullied. Um, and the thing I can remember, just trying to answer your question, everybody does ask me that. I don't know if there ever was a certain period where I realized there's nothing wrong with me. I grew up all along that there's nothing wrong with me. I kept thinking somebody, something was wrong with you. Cause exactly. like three guys came up when I was a teenager and they walked up to me at a movie theater and I was talking to my girlfriend and they going, blah, 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 blah. look at the retard. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh my goodness. I went home and I felt bad. And then my father mother uh, with my aunt, my father sister, she looked at me and she said, what's wrong? And I said, I feel bad for Jim, Bob and Steve. She goes, why? I think they have a learning disability. They, she goes, why do you think that? Because all three of them came up to me and they were like, blah, 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 blah. I need to fight for them. She just laughed. She just laughed and said, I ain't going to worry about you at all. I said, well, what's wrong with them? She goes, there's nothing wrong with them. Not a thing wrong with them. There's Paul is going to say something here. Yeah, yeah I, I, I want to try and answer your question a little bit because I, I was curious about that as well myself. How okay. did Kenny become such a good storyteller before he went to school to study storytelling? And part of the answer, I believe, is when he was young and the you know the teacher sits in front of the students and reads the book in kindergarten well you know she holds the the book up you know in front of her face so kenny can't see her lips my, my, so he my. can't tell what she's saying so mm -hmm. he would then go get the book in the library and sit down on the floor of the library and read the books to himself and and, and he would end up acting them, acting out the scenes and taking on the, the personalities of the characters in the books, you know, so he's reading Cinderella and he's pretending to be Cinderella and then he's pretending to be the fairy godmother and then he's pretending to be one of the horses. And he's, he's doing that because the way a, a deaf child experiences life and experiences stories is not verbally because they can't so imagination they experience it visually mm. so for kenny to really understand stories he has to see it happen or act it out himself he can't just read the words they just don't make as much sense to him so to me one of the reasons why he's such a good storyteller is that he he creates a visual scene for you when he tells stories and he he does that because that's the way he experiences stories. He experiences them visually, whereas you and I experience them in a more auditory fashion. And to me, that's one of the keys that makes him a uniquely gifted storyteller. He is very gifted. And I, when, I th I, when I said he's a genius, I meant it. When I said you're a genius, Kenny, I meant it in a <laughs> professional way because my other profession, I'm a talent agent. I'm a SAG after talent agent. And I meet talent all the time. And the way you were presenting your story, it was very capturing, like engaging. And that takes guts and it takes know-how, how to do it. That's not an average person t telling a story. You said something, you, you said something early on, Kenny, where you said you, are a, you're a, you have a body of a man, but also the heart of a child. Yeah. I wonder if that is what brings this joy, because you have a personality, a joyful personality. Personality yeah. has sense of humor. You don't see, difficult, although there are difficult times and difficult things in life, but you don't see them that way. 
I wonder if it's the child in you seeing this thing and goes further. But you're, you're achieving things. Like when you finish your master, that's not an easy task. Tell me more about that. And I want to say something to the audience out there. Ladies and gentlemen, you can hear me. Paul can hear me. Kenny is reading my lips. He can't hear. Whatever I'm telling to him now and telling to you, he's reading my lips to be able to communicate with us. Please go ahead, Kenny. Oh, um, actually, basically, I never dreamed of getting a master because I mean, that wasn't my plan. Uh, all this is from, you know, again, my faith, it was part of the plan. I finished getting my Bachelor of Art in theater. I'm an actor as well, and I love acting. I, I, I love to be a character. And um, so I went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and uh, everything was fine. And then I started getting tech and calls from friends in Knoxville and Memphis. Uh, and here, I had a dear friend here that's an interpreter named Libby. And everybody was just sending me these, you know, during the month I already graduated with my BA and I was happy. And I was laughing too, because I was like, hi, I did it. I passed the third grade, suckers. I mean, you know, that was just like a kid doing it. And I thought, oh, I wish I could go back to Memphis and, you know, tell these suckers I did it. And tell my doctor and psychiatrist, but they're all dead. Anyway, they were telling me about this master program. It's the only one in the world. And that's in Johnson City at East Tennessee State University. So they convinced me to go. And I didn't really care if I get a master. And in story time, to me, it was natural. I mean, again, I felt like it's a gift. That's my life. And uh, so I said, oh, what the heck, I just go. And, uh, I love going to college. It makes me feel young. And so I, Libby told me to meet this man named Dr. Shovel. And he was the head of the program. And but she, didn't, she told me he's a sweet man and really nice and all this. And he looked forward to meeting you. So she set it up and I went to his office at ETSU. I was living in Knoxville at the time, which is about two hours drive. I came to ETSU, went to his office, and the door was open and he would have his back to the door on the computer and I tapped the door and then I didn't hear anything. So I tapped the door again. Then I heard someone going, like, wow. So I knocked again. And I heard, oh, no, 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 no. And he turned around. He said, you're just going to stand here? I told you to come in. What is it? Oh, oh my God. You can't be Dr. Trouble. Wow. What, what do you want? I'm going, oh, my God. So my mind said, you know, the heck with you. I ain't going to do that program when you're in charge. So I turned around like a child. But I was being bald at. Then like, I'm serious about um, the next part of me to bed grab my shoulder and turn me around and say, get back in that office and tell me who you are. So I turn around, walk in the office and said, I'm Kenny Tepper. And he's going, oh, 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 here we go again. Everybody does that when they find out I'm deaf. And I'm going, then he tells me I was deaf. Oh, oh. He grabbed the phone and said, who are you calling now, the police? He goes, no, I need, I need to call an interpreter. Why are we communicating right now? He goes, yeah, uh, um, I would say, you know, it's like, don't have a heart attack, honey. That's the last thing I need. So finally, I got him to calm down, and then we sit. And then he started, I, he said, tell me about yourself. Tell me about yourself. And I just started talking about where I'm from, my girl, and why I like to get a master in storytelling. And then he just stopped me. He, he actually did that. He went, whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop. And I said, oh, OK, OK, what's up? He goes, how old are you? And I said, they defined you right away. Mm. I, I said, what, I'm supposed to be at age limit to get a master? No, but you the most beautiful. My God, you look and talk like a child. I mean, it's beautiful. Mm. I, I mean, my God, your life story come to life. He said, okay, so da, da, da. next thing you know, I'm in the program. And um, it took me uh, uh, like an extra year because I had a lot of help with my paper. With a master, you have to have a thesis. I had a friend help me, but I had to get the board of directors of ETSU to get permission for someone to type my paper while I talk. And she did. She's a wonderful lady named Val. And she typed my paper. And I spent a whole week with her and her, and her husband in uh, North Carolina. This is how, this is how you turn your assignment in? 
by actually telling to somebody and she's typing? Yes. Yes, I tell my story to type it. I mean, I did research, don't get me wrong. She didn't do everything. I did do some research. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. And then after after that, I mean, even the one that's doing it, she had to stop so many times. She was crying so hard. And I was like, why are you crying? It's so beautiful. Oh, your daddy. Oh, my God. I need to go call my dad. I need to call my mama. And I said, why does nobody keep saying that? Don't you talk to your parents now? So I have a totally different philosophy of life. I think Paul wants to say something. That's wonderful. Paul, you yeah, wanted yeah, to I, say something. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the part that the audience probably missed in there is that uh, when Kenny finally got his master's degree, he was 55 years old. Mm. I mean, he had several attempts. He, he went to Gallaudet University and, um, you know, tried his best, but, you know, f but honestly failed out of that program and, and, and tried at another university. And I mean, because he, he has some significant challenges that most of us Definitely. don't have. And so higher education was, was really difficult for him, but he persevered because he, he kept at it over and over and over again, multiple programs. And it took him longer than it took most people. But, you know, at the age of 55, he ended up with that master's degree. I think he got his bachelor's degree at 49 or, or 50. How or, long did it take him to finish his master? How long did it take him? So was it th three years in the master's program, Kenny? Three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half years. Um, I, had, yeah. I had to go a half a semester because I made a, a C minor with my DA. And you have to have a B to get a master. So I was on probation for one semester, but I made three days. Right. Because I've been a program that I love. You know, he mm -hmm. had to, it took him a while to get the, the, it took him, you know, a couple of decades to get his bachelor's degree because he had to try over and over That's and over true. again. And mm -hmm. so his perseverance is just inspiring. That's amazing. I mean, mind you, at the post-secondary and higher education, there is no advocacy for disabled individual. His parents or he, the individual, must advocate for himself. I'm writing an art, actually an article on it, but also a book. It's called Reasonable Accommodation, What Leaders Must Do. And it deals exactly with the issue of higher education and disabled individuals. Paul, let me kindly see the book. So this is the book, Four Days with Kenny Thetford. That's the book you wrote, Paul, with Kenny. What, first, what do you want your leaders to know about it? What do you want our audience to know? I am going to also have a follow-up question, follow question on this because I've seen the performance of Kenny. He mentioned he is also an actor or talent of sort. So I was, the follow-up question is, do you think you'll be turning this book to a script where you can actually turn it into a movie or a feature of sort? I do think it would make an amazing uh, screenplay for somebody just to see Kenny's life story. Um, but to answer your first question, you know, what, what does this mean to leaders? We, we actually did, um, as we went through the book, um, I made notes in the text of places where you could actually learn leadership lessons from for work as well. So I tried to make the book as useful for most audiences. So not only people who have disabilities, but again, people who love someone who has disabilities, but then I also called out anytime I was learning a lesson that was applicable to my job, I tried to call that out as well. So I think it's a very practical book, but mostly it's just a beautiful book. I mean, it, it so just- So inspirational. Yeah, just getting to listen to Kenny's life stories. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's happy and it's sad, it's tragic, it's, it's hilarious. I mean, you know, there's just some really funny moments in Kenny's life, as you can imagine, somebody going through life in the body of a grown man, but with the mind of a child, mm -hmm. funny things are bound to happen and they do, and, and we don't shy away from them. We also don't shy away from some of the really controversial topics like racism and, and child sexual molestation. And, you know, we, we take on some pretty serious topics because seeing those topics through the mind of a, of a deaf child really makes you reevaluate re it through a different lens. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the beauty of the book as well that I hope people would appreciate. That's wonderful. And Kenny, what do you want people to know about your story? You were a very instrumental part in writing the story with Paul. What do you want people to know about you and about your story and people who live like you? You're unique, but it doesn't mean you're different. You are special because you are special. We are different. We are the one that should learn more and should behave differently. It's not you. You're, you're, God, you're God gift to us to teach us a lesson. What do you want our audience, plus your readers, to know when you write a book like this with Paul? 
one of the things that changed all the time is because of the coronavirus, yeah, uh, spend more time at home and, you know, I love writing, but everybody who got hope get a chance to get the book. Um, is that our life can change in a, in a split second. Mm. I mean, a, a split second. Yes. And so we can lose someone in a split second. Yes. And I, there's a lot of stories in my book. I, I, my whole family passed away uh, on my side of the family. I have no one now, it's just me. And so they're all gone. And they were expecting me to die before them. You know, and I said, ha ha, you know, sucker. But I mean, I'm not saying to be ugly. These are just my family. No, this is you, just, this just is me. me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just saying, oh, don't, don't. I mean, for me, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna have his door like, let me in, let me in. He said, we're not finished with you till you're 200. Okay, fine. So I want people to realize, like I'm talking to you, I should take that chance. If I ever see you again, it'd be great. But you know, in person, it'd be awesome. But if I don't, you're an inspiration. And you know, I think you're awesome. And uh, so, and with Paul, you know, you know, I, I saw him for him. He got to know me too long. And uh, that's just a joke. But, uh, but I'm just saying that if you have someone sick and you have not taken the chance to pick up that phone, now again, we don't use phone, but text, a simple text. Mm. Connect text, with others. Text, Mm. Yeah, I love you, mom. Hey, I love you, mom. You know, it's going to be okay, mom. Dad, sister, mm. brother, cousin, friend. If you have a family, like now with a coronavirus, I've had several friends that had gotten coronavirus, but by the grace of God, none of them had died. And so uh, I tell people, we have all this time on our hands. Let's try to love. Make, make a dozen cookies, okay? <laughs> make, take it to your neighbor. Yes. Go to the nursing home, you know, share the key, walk around and tell a story about your life, something. And the holidays are just around the corner. Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Invite someone to your house for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Come on, you know, if we just invite three or four people, think about what we can make a difference in this world. And particularly invite somebody that's totally different than you. You know, like in my book, I never knew anything about black. I, I mean, the N word when I was little growing up. My mother, mm-hmm. my father never said it. We had friends that were black. We had friends that were Hispanic. And all I did was watch my parents respond to human beings. And then when they died, I moved to Memphis. And that was the very first time I heard the envoy from my foster father. And then it was the first time I ever rode on a bus. And so it's in my book. And, and, and everything was fantastic. You know, but my point is, I don't see your color. Right. If you're Indian, I'm talking about, I think we're supposed to say Native Indian, and then you're Indian, uh, India, uh, I don't care. I find out that, and this is one thing I don't understand, I tell that to your audience. If somebody comes out to you and say, especially you would think going like it is, if I don't understand this about parents and brothers and, or friends, we, I, I can say, you're my dearest best friend for the past 20 years. I love you like a brother. I love Paul like a brother. And then I, you come to me and say, I can't take it no more. I got to say the truth. I'm gay. Mm-hmm. I go, oh my God, that's cool. Really? Tell me more about it. Because I don't know anything about it. I did now. I mean, got friends that are gay. But uh, my point is, why do we jump to the conclusion when somebody comes to somebody like a father and mother, dad, mom, I'm gay. And they kick him out of the house, put him on the street. That's been your son for years. I didn't, I don't, this is, I'm going to answer your question a long time ago. Mm-hmm. I don't, I never understood that. I mean, I don't blame God for anything. I mean, when I broke my neck, when I fell off the cliff, that was my fault because I climbed over the fence. I broke the law. So I'm just saying, meeting you is a, just an honor. You are a winner. You're successful because of this attitude. This attitude of being colorless, being a human being, that's a winner. That's a, that's a winner, and I admire that. Paul, where can people find the book? Letting people know the story of celebrating Kenny. But let's say if someone wants to know, learn more about the stories in the book, where can they find it? Yeah, so I, I think it's on most of the major online retailers on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. So if you go to those 
places where you buy books online and just search for four days with Kenny Tedford. They'll find it. Uh, but they could also uh, find it on Kenny's website, which is just kennytedford.com. And you can learn more about Kenny's speaking engagements and the things that he, he does, the shows that he does, um, uh, as well as uh, links to the book there. Is there anything else you want us to, to know about Kenny, the stories before I go back to Kenny? Because Kenny is going to read us or tell us, share with us a story from the book. We oh, end up with that. So is yeah. there anything else you want us to know? No, I would never want to get in between an audience and a Kenny Tedford story. Wow. So get right That's to nice. that. Kenny, it's your turn, sir. Tell us anything you want to share with us from the, from the book or a story you lived. Any you stories? Want to share one of the stories? Any stories? Yeah, you know what, Kenny? What, since you mentioned uh, Memphis and, and racism, why don't you tell the story about being on the back of the bus there? I think that would be appropriate. Uh, okay. Um, well, my mother, my father died at Christmas when I was uh, eight. A week before Christmas, he had a heart attack. Five months later, my mother died, which I found out, and the wisdom. Is that right? Sorry for your loss. Yes. 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 Somehow, her brain exploded. Yes. I don't know. Something to do with the blood vessel. But uh, she, she, she on the rhythm. Now it's in May. And then we moved to Memphis to stay with my foster mother, which is my father's sister. And uh, my foster father, for some reason, never wanted me. He, he, he even told me what other people did, retarded. I'm not offending nobody, I hope. I, I'm not in the, you know, the political correctly. I'm just telling you a story from, it was in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. And so I was called retarded, no good, worthless. And this was coming from my foster father. And so my foster parent only took four of us that I can remember. And that was Sandy, me, Mary, and Robert. We were the youngest. All the others were married or in the military. So he even told me to my face, you know, we, we could have put you in an institution, you know, for, for, for the disabled, the retard, you know, whatever. And he just kept, I kept asking questions as, we, as I grew up. And he just kept saying, why are you asking so many questions? Quit reading, you can't read. And, you know, the government's going to take care of you. So I experienced on the bus, uh, before Paul does a timeout, uh, my Aunt Jessie doesn't drive. She doesn't drive. And they knew something was wrong with me besides being a slow learner. Um, I wasn't hearing anything. I mean, somebody could be behind me. And she said, we are always shouting at you. And then when you turn the TV on, you put it so high, it hurts our ears. I said, well, I like to hear the noise. And she said, we need to go to get your hearing check. So we did. And it was the very first time I ever rode on a, a city bus. And they just meant us. So we went down to the corner and I loved it because my father mother had on this uh, dress with flowers all over and a hat and a big purse and her arm and her coat. And I was like, so we walked down to the corner and the bus came, doors open, we got in. And the, the man driving, you know, just looked at us, hurry up, hurry up. You know, and I was like, God, you know. So we got on the bus and we sat right behind the bus driver. And so there's a, there's a I don't know, a class or whatever it is here. I see the back of his head. And so different people, it's kind of a full bus. And then I noticed on the far back of the bus, it's all black. Most of the guys, you know. And I'm looking like, well, that's odd. And then the bus took off and it came to another stop. And this older woman that was black was getting on the bus. And my father taught me to be kind to older people. So she was trying to get up on the bus with a cane. And I, I stood up and my father mother grabbed back into my blue jeans and pulled me down. She said, what's your doing? I'm having an old lady get on the bus. And she got to the top of the shelf. I tried to get up again and reach for the woman. And my father mother pulled me back down. And the, father, the, the woman, she was African-American. And she looked at me with a most beautiful smile. And she said, it's okay, it's okay. And I went, no, it's not. And then my father's mother grabbed my mouth and she goes, shh. And so she goes, it's okay. And then the bus driver took off. And she almost stumbled. And so I, I kind of got, got up real quick, I help her sit. And she walked, she said, she couldn't sit up front. She had to go to the back. And she said, she said, God bless you. And so she went to the back. 
And I sat back down. I was mad now. I mean, I was like, woo, you know, what is wrong with you? And so, you know, she goes to church. She's a church lady. And, you know, you wouldn't let me help somebody? But she looked at me and said, uh, and the bus driver turned his head, and I could see his lip. He said, ma'am, if you don't control that boy, you're all going to get off this butt, you and him. And then I looked at her, and then we stopped in, I was out. And then the guys in the back would enjoy, oh, I, I could feel the cool breeze, that, like the air conditioning coming from back there, like a fan, I guess. But every time that door opened, the heat would come in. It was in the middle, you know, it was in the end of August. And um, <laughs> I love it. I started to get up, walk to the back. My father might have grabbed my pants, pulled me back down. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to go sit in the back. And I'm, I'm driving, you better get that boy to shut up. And she looked at me, we don't want to get kicked off the bus. What is wrong with you people? They're the smart one, the black people back there, they got air conditioning, you know, we got the heat. No, oh, stupid. <laughs> and then all the black people, ah, oh, where's the white boy? Hey. And I was like, hey. And then she looked at me, oh my God, we're going to get kicked off the bus. I said, you can't kick us off the bus. And so none of this made any sense to me. The fire the bus driver, you know, and we kept stopping, most of the black got off, and we're the last one. And then we got off, and he was a happy puppy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, so I, got, I told him, have a good day. You know, you need it. <laughs> so we got he needed a lesson in. then. He needed a lesson. She turned me around. She said, don't ever do that again. And I never knew you years later what was going on. That's the most innocent story I've ever heard. That's beautiful. And Paul, most of the stories in the book like that, huh? Yeah, very much. It, it, in fact, uh, the title, the subtitle of the book is life through the eyes of a child trapped in a, a partially blind and deaf man's body mm. because that you get to see life through the eyes of that young boy that young innocent boy deaf boy as you said and it just looks very different when you see it through those eyes mm -hmm. if i make oh. something as yes. i can yes but i don't think i really enjoy more than anything which i'm still trying to comprehend but i'm very grateful uh, for what i do paul that invited me to go to his youngest son, public school. And so Paul invited me to speak at his son's school. And I kind of felt, eh, because I didn't want to embarrass his son, you know, about some of the story. And so Paul, no, no, you just come. You know, I think if I'm correct, I had probably going to be like 50 students. These are teenagers. And I think to be 50 students. So we're behind the curtain. And I don't hear anything. Paul kept looking around the curtain, looking at me, he looked around the curtain, looked at me, but he looked so suspicious, like something's going on. I said, what is it? It's nothing. So I got up and looked around the curtain. <gasps> there was like 300 kids, 350. Mm -hmm. Waiting I got, you didn't tell me it was that many. Do I did? Were you done this? No. So these are teenagers, okay? You can't keep teenagers sitting there. So we already discussed what I was going to talk about. He introduced me. And I spoke and got pinheads. And the greatest blessing was always from the son and his classmate. I got a thin ovation. I mean, you know, as a murder of and speaker. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I guess I can do kids, you know, teenagers particularly. And, uh, and then that evening, his son came home. He said, you made me very much of a celebrity. And that's the first time I ever seen anybody stand up to a speaker and stand ovation. I said, Seriously, you're the first. He said, I'm so good. So I hope to go. I'd love to go again, so I'm trying to, I'm doing advertising, but I don't like that. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> you are wonderful. You're wonderful. The only thing in sign language I know is this. Amen. I love you. That's the only thing I know. Well, you're that's wonderful. all you need. That, do that to everybody You make a child happy. Thank you for this insightful time with you. And please you. keep on, keep on sharing your insights and love to others every race every color they think they're better and people like you in the work of paul in bringing your story to the world to make a humanity better because when we face god later on or we face whomever he's not going to look at it's but by the deed how we served others and this place we call earth paul anything you want to add uh, just uh i 
I don't think a conversation can ever do justice to what's between the pages of this book. Yes. So uh, I give it a read, and I think you'll be a better person for it. Please, people. The name of the book is Four Days with Kenny Bedford. It's already on Amazon. It's in the market. It's also on Kenny's website and in Paul's website as well. Hey, Kenny, anything you want to say to us before we end? I do want to say that to anybody, to a child, uh, even adults, but mostly children today, um, never give up on your dream. I've been told all the way through high school I was worthless. And uh, Paul and I put them on, or lazy, helped me get it out there to the world. And uh, dreams do come true. And so no matter how difficult uh, adversity you have to face tomorrow, tonight, in the two hours, um, it's going to get better. And I know we all hear that. But as a witness, uh, it's going to get better. And don't lose hope. Just read my work, and, and uh, hopefully you'll get Good thing How about to a disabled individual, whether a child or an adult, a disabled individual that looks different, has physical disabilities or invisible disabilities, he knows the difficulties that he's living. What's your advice to them? Not everybody will share this pain he has or she has, but you have lived it and you achieved things in life. And you're, you're already a motivational speaker as far as I can tell. And with your keynotes speaking, engagements in speeches to others you're becoming an instrument of help to others so i want an advice from you to people with disability especially the one that feel the difficult times they're going through and they haven't reached a peak of success or even achievement what's your advice to them i tell all children uh even in kids and even if you later as a teenager, you're in a way for an accident, you know, cancer or whatever, like I did. I always think, think for yourself. I mean, if we listen to what's around us, if I had actually focused and just pay attention, a stranger telling me I'm retarded, no good. My father planted the greatest seed of all. He said, you're not my son with a disability. You're my son. That's it. You're my son. And everybody ever tell me I have a disability. I just thank God I'm not your son. You know, because that's all they see. So I tell people whether you're a daughter, a son, and uncle, cousin, whatever, for many of our military people who come back from the war, uh, I'm grateful for them. I thank them all. But you come back different. You, you know, you left uh, on both feet. And you come back with no feet, no leg. But guess what? If your name was Kenny, and you came back with no leg, guess what? You're still Kenny. You're still the person you were when you left. Mm -hmm. so get around, and I tell them this is the truth. Hang around people that are positive and believe in you. For everyone that's negative, five people would say, we love you. I'm saying it, and I don't have to meet you. I love you all. You know, we love you. We want you someday to be there and drive out every day and get to meet people. But, remember there is somebody out there that truly loves you. That's nice. That's very nice. Paul? Yeah. L let me just to answer that question, if I could, I'll, I'll read to you two pieces of advice that we summarized at the end of the book, one for people with disabilities and one for people who love someone with disabilities. In that second group, the one, the advice for people who love someone with disabilities, um, number nine is don't introduce them with their disability. She isn't your deaf friend. She's your friend. He isn't your autistic brother. He's your brother. You don't need to warn anyone about their abilities. They'll find out soon enough on their own. Would you like to be introduced as someone's fat sister or ugly brother? Probably not. The qualifier isn't necessary. Drop it. For uh, the people who have disabilities themselves, number two on our list is be the teacher. Don't be offended when people violate all the advice in the next section about how to be around people like you. It's natural. Look at it as an opportunity to teach them. When they ask you questions, just answer them as directly and honestly as you can, even if the questions hurt a little. What's it like to be in a wheelchair? Why do you talk funny? Is it true blind people hear better? You seem different. What's wrong with you? Answer their questions. Then you can teach them how to ask it better if you think they should. Be a teacher, 
not a victim. So the last chapter is full of our kind of summary of pieces of advice like that after looking through Kenny's life story. That's very nice, he said. And I hope people have listened to the last message of Paul. See people as people, regardless of race, color, disability, age, or sexual orientation. Thank you both. Thank you so much, both of you, for making my day, because you just enlightened my day, made it better by listening to these inspirational stories. And I, I do hope that they will make a difference in the lives of our audience, whoever listened to this podcast or show or read your book. The intention is to serve others and be of service to others. So I thank you both very much. Very welcome. Thank Thanks for having us thank on. You oh, we're talking the same time. Thank you, and thank for your listeners, and I am bless you for having me on your show. And Paul, love you too, big guy. <laughs> Bye-bye.